hostile. 12 o'clock at 6 miles. What is this tech they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before? I don't like the look of this. That was above and beyond, Crimson King. Isn't the Landesite off-world, sir? would like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over at the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable first 90 days, no questions asked. What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no censors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have Vimeo that we're partnering with, and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. Would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you, and thank you so much. For the last couple of years, I have been investigating Antarctica and what may have happened to a culture that used to live there. Even mainstream science admits that the continent hasn't always been frozen over. That at one time it was a lush, tropical paradise that was likely inhabited. Strangely enough, recent events have started to parallel a theory that I've been working on. I haven't really brought it out on YouTube yet. But I think when you look at all of the pieces of the puzzle, you'll see what I'm seeing. I've mentioned before that my background, military background, was in human intelligence. Um, that time I was called an quote-unquote interrogator. These days they have, of course, the sanitized name human intelligence collector. But a lot of the study is psychiatry in the state of the human mind. One thing that is evidence of a well-adjusted human being is the pushback against isolation. No normal person will choose isolation indefinitely over being in some type of a social environment. Now, today we have the ability to connect through our devices, so it's a little bit morphed and a little bit skewed in the sense that you can physically be alone while still engaging with other individuals. So this is kind of a unique time in history, but imagine if that didn't exist and someone attempted to do what they've just done to this country and around the world last three or four months, I think there would have been a much greater pushback than what we saw. And that would be a sign of mental health. That would be the appropriate reaction. Putting people in isolation is a form of torture. It is a technique used by intelligence services around the world to extract information because human beings of any kind will choose anything other than isolation. There have been uh, events and uh, studies done, criminals that have fled the law 
and fled to other countries and gone out into the hills to avoid being prosecuted or arrested, over a long enough time period will either pass away, will go crazy, or will rejoin society risking getting caught. There's no living out in the middle of nowhere like Grizzly Adams for the rest of your natural life and being a normal, well-adjusted human being. It just doesn't happen. Those that have been found living, absent of any other interactions, are markedly very strange people and somewhat mentally ill. Now, why did I waste three minutes on this? Who remembers the story of the plane crash in the Andes, the movie Alive? Remember the people. They tried to signal. They tried to... Uh, show people they were still down there, but nobody came and nobody came. And it started to affect them mentally. One of the aspects of the story was that they began cannibalism, which is kind of a touchy subject for this platform. I think in this particular um, way, we can probably talk about it because it ties in the mental state of the people going through the isolation to their actions. And my allegation about Antarctica is that those people, because of some natural event, were not only um, put into a situation where it was very difficult to survive because of the weather, but they were also isolated. And that isolation is the key. And we see remnants of that mental break in cultures in South America. Because when they were finally able to make their way back out, we start to see behaviors and things cropping up in culture down there that you don't see really anywhere else. And that's why I tie this together. Now, what got me down this road, there's a series on Freeform. It's a very obscure little network called Siren, and it's about mermaids that make their way back up onto land. Because, of course, there's, a, there's of course, a political aspect to it. Uh, the oceans are getting polluted, and it's affecting their ability to reproduce. And, of course, there's good mermaids and bad mermaids, and there's good humans and bad humans. Of course, it has the Hollywood plot to it. But one of the things about their... Uh, take on mermaids is very, very reminiscent of what we might have seen in Antarctica. Because they've lived isolated for so long, they have become a little bit off. Just not quite there all the way. And the actress that plays the lead character, um, Aline is her name, E-L-I-N-E, -I, -N -E. I thought they were doing something with CGI, with her eyes, now most at least guys who are watching it probably aren't spending a whole lot of time looking at her eyes. But if you do, you'll notice that there's something very odd about them. And this is just kind of an aside. I'm not saying anything particularly is wrong with the actress, but mermaids were seen as devourers of humans. Now, fish are, by nature, by... Um, definition have to be cannibals. Big fish eat little fish. We don't see usually larger bears eating smaller bears. We don't see larger lions eating pumas and bobcats. But fish seem to be the exception to where people aren't so uh, put off by the cannibalistic nature of the beast. But this was something that is part of that. There's been a virus discovered in Brazil that they have found genes they can't identify in. And they've named it after a goddess, Yara, which was a mermaid-like goddess. And the story kind of goes two different directions, but it takes you back to these people, the Tupi people that believe in this and that propagated the story. And they were cannibals. They were cannibalistic by nature. 
Now, the other part of the story is that it was, um, it, I want to pronounce this properly, but I don't think I'm going to be able to. I P U P I A R A, Ipupiaria, something like that. Um, cannibalistic eater of human beings is the male aspect of the same god, Iara, god goddess Iara. Now, I want you to stick with me here for just a minute, because I'm going to show some images that talk about this idea. Through no fault of your own, you've become a culture that has been isolated. And because of the natural event, you have been forced to live underground, under an ice sheet, absent sunshine, absent access to light, not for six months or nine months or a year, but for 10 years, 20 years, generations go by. And every time you make your way to the surface, it's an impossible place to, uh, to live or to stay for very long to even try to signal for help, forget, launch a boat and try to seek assistance anywhere else because of the roaring 40s. You would then be in an isolated culture, living under the ice. There would probably be some ability to socialize amongst your group, but it would only take probably one or two disease outbreaks to redu reduce your population to the point where it might not be sustainable. Or there might be so much interbreeding that it becomes a... Uh, something hellish, some very strange existence that that's all you do for hundreds of years is exist. And then six, eight, 10, 12 generations down the road, all of a sudden, these new creatures show up, meaning us, and start to populate the outskirts of this area. Now, stories being what they are and culture being what it is, as things go down through the years, cannibalism at one time having been necessary for survival, now is just one of those cultural things that you don't think about. It's just something that's done. When and if it's necessary, without any real negative repercussions. outside world might see you as absolutely crazy, absolutely nuts, but within your own group, you would be seen as very normal. There have been stories about scientists that have gone down to Antarctica and have come back completely damaged and changed by things they saw down there that they can't talk about. I think, uh, who was it that went down there and said that it was just unspeakable evil? Now, let's jump back to these maps that we used for so long, uncovering what cultures were doing in Brazil and South America, Terra del Fuego. They described giants, giants that were cannibalistic by nature. Now, South America isn't a place where you have to be cannibalistic. There's food everywhere. There's fish everywhere. Starvation in South America is virtually non-existent unless there's some other force preventing you from getting to the plentiful food that's everywhere. It's not like a desert. But yet these people practice this, and we see this in the maps. There were two things that the Europeans found aberrant. It was the homosexuality and the, uh, the cannibalism of these giants. And what we see is a culture that we would have described as absolutely crazy, absolutely nuts. Here's a map I haven't used before, but it shows a couple of different places where they set upon visitors and, you know, have them basically for dinner. 
And this is a closer and zoomed image. But the point of all this is that if they were isolated for long enough, they would have gone crazy. They would have gone nuts. And that craziness would have then become an aspect of culture. It would have stopped being seen as crazy, even though it is. It wouldn't have been seen that way. And that cultural aspect could have bled its way north into South America. And that was kind of the idea where we started way back here. That what we've just gone through might be a microcosm of what happened down there just over, instead of three, six months, maybe 150 years. So when people say, well, if there's people living under the ice in Antarctica, why haven't they signaled us? Why haven't we seen them come to the surface? Maybe because at some point they just gave up. Like the people in the Andes. And they just decided to walk out. Unfortunately, that's not an option in Antarctica. You can't literally walk from Antarctica to South America. But now as we see things begin to melt down there, as we see things begin to uh, uncover, we're going to probably start to see things that just don't make a lot of sense. And I wanted to show this because it's really, really close to being something that I think we, we can call um, evidence of culture. Now, this is a left-facing skull with an elongated head, as we've seen before. We can see a chin. We can see a mouth. We can see what looks like some type of a nose. We can see an eye socket. We can see a brow. And then, of course, we can see the giant elongated head. We have, what is that, one, two, three, four, five, six features in this one image of this skull. And if I had found one thing or two things or even ten things over two, two years, yeah, you could probably call that apophenia or pareidolia. But we've found hundreds of things across the spectrum from whether it was artwork, whether it's evidence of like we did in the last Antarctica video, we showed some type of a smokestack. Um, animals that we can't identify. Buildings that have not been identified. Evidence along the coast of ports. Ships. Pretty much everything that you would expect from a culture, we've found imagery of down there. So, anyway, I will leave it there. I know this was a complex video with a lot of ideas in it. But that's the great thing about YouTube is you can watch things over and over again. And you can kind of soak it all in. So, thank you everyone who supported the channel. We're going to keep looking into this. Like, share, subscribe, and we will see you next time. would like to briefly take a moment and say thank you to everyone who has continued to join us over at the Florida Maquis Patreon channel. The Holy Bible teaches us, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. If you'd like to join us over there, it's only one U.S. dollar per month at the base level, and even less than that if you sign up for an entire year, and no matter what level you choose, it's fully refundable, First 90 days, no questions asked. 
What's the difference between YouTube and Patreon? At Patreon, we can take the gloves off. There are no sensors. We have, of course, the Patreon firewall, and then we also have Vimeo that we're partnering with, and that gives us one extra layer of protection where we can speak our minds and we can take advantage of rights that we used to enjoy in this country freely. Would love to have you over there. There are hundreds of exclusive videos never before seen here on YouTube. Please, if you have the ability, would love to have you over there. You won't regret it. God bless all of you, and thank you so much. Hot time, 12 o'clock at 6 miles. What is this tack they're looking for anyway? It's some kind of weapon left by the ancients. The kind that decides who wins the war. Have Moloch's warriors been here before? I don't like the look of this. That was above and beyond. Isn't the Landesite off-world, sir?